Castillo did not seem certain about the make or caliber of the rifle, but finally said that he thought it was Russian. Lake told him to shoot a man in the back seat of an open car in the middle of the caravan. He said that the man would be seated with a lady or another man. A mirror was to be flashed twice from a building across the street so that Castillo would know when he was to shoot. When he saw the two flashes, he was supposed to shoot at the next car coming into view. When he was questioned about the identity of the man riding in the open car, Castillo said that he did not know who the victim was. After Lake had assembled the rifle and had given Castillo his instructions, he went downstairs. Later, Lake rushed into the room. Quote, they got him already, Lake told him. Let's get out of here. He then grabbed the rifle away from Castillo, dismantled it and stuffed it and the scope into the black bag. Castillo and Lake rushed downstairs, got into a car with two other men, and drove away from the building. They picked up a bald-headed, skinny man after they turned the first corner. Three or four blocks later, the car stopped and picked up another man. Castillo said he was riding in the back seat between Lake and the man who had joined them at the second stop. As the car drove away from the scene of the crime, the unidentified man gave Castillo an injection while he wasn't looking. He went immediately to sleep and woke up in a Chicago hotel room with Mrs. Kreps. He and Mrs. Kreps got into a blue car and drove to Milwaukee, Castillo said. While driving there, they heard the news of the assassination of John F. Kennedy on the car radio. Within a few days after the hypnotist submitted his final report, Castillo was out of the NBI jail and had left the Philippines for parts unknown. It was later uncovered that Castillo was returned to the United States in 1967 and questioned by the FBI, whose spokesman said, quote, We talked to Castillo and he told us that he'd fabricated his story about the Kennedy assassination, said he'd made it up in Manila. The official record says that Castillo was sentenced to six years in the Missouri Penitentiary for robbery in June 1971. On August 1st, 1974, he was released after serving 37 months. Castillo's last known contact was with his mother shortly after his release from prison. Since then, he has disappeared from both his family and those researchers who would like to question him further. If Castillo had indeed made it up in Manila, as the FBI spokesman claimed, then he would have had to have had a phenomenal memory, an incredibly high tolerance to sodium amytal and alcohol, and virtuoso acting ability. Neither the psychological profile nor the life history of Luis Angel Castillo supports the conclusion that he possessed any of these talents. Okay, um, that's the end of, of uh, Bauer's, cha Bauer's chapter on Luis Castillo. There are a lot of things that uh, we ought to mention here, uh, reviewing a few things. First of all, it's interesting to note that Castillo uh, referred to Papa and Alan uh, and, and hinted uh, at an identity, which certainly sounds curiously like that, that of Alan Dulles. Of course, Alan Dulles was director of the Central Intelligence Agency until the Bay of Pigs, and of course, uh, Castillo's background seems to intersect with uh, the Cuban situation quite heavily. Uh, of course, Alan Dulles was also on the Warren Commission. It's interesting that Castillo would have uh, introduced this, this A.D. figure. Remember that Castillo had scars on his arms, chest, and stomach. Now, that recalls, at least in some ways, Mr. Pettit, who had all kinds of scars. And, uh, of course, he was involved in a plane crash. But uh, recall that uh, we don't know what the nature of those scars were. Were they in any way related to surgical implants? I recall the RHIC, EDOM technology. Uh, it's worth noting that... Uh, Castillo seems to have had a penchant for suicide. First of all, the uh, Central Intelligence Agency's assassination programs, their attempts to get uh, someone to commit assassinations against their will, frequently involved having the mind control assassin uh, commit suicide afterwards so he would not be available to, uh, to to spill the beans, so to speak. Now, recall that Castillo attempted to swallow a box, a, a, a a, a, what is it? A tube of epoxy, and also then uh, apparently a number of different uh, it, combinations of those letters on the cigarette package would get him to kill himself. And uh, it's also worth noting too that the the frightening degree of conditioning. Again, look at how complex this situation is. Four different zombie identities, which which not only gave different information but apparently responded in different physiological terms. Now, uh, this again the 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 Castillo incident occurred in 1967, and uh, as I said, the the 
mind control technology was fully operational by then, and apparently, at least according to William Stevenson, it dates back to World War II, and that uh, the almost unbelievable degree of sophistication in the conditioning of Castillo certainly lends credence to the notion that uh, there is that degree of conditioning. So uh, keep all of these things in mind, and as a final little uh, comment here on... Uh, Mind Control. We're going to read you a couple of uh, pages again from Operation Mind Control by Walter Bowert. And this concerns an interview with a U.S. government assassin. Now, uh, Bowert does not name this person. He, the interview was arranged by a chemist. This person apparently had served in the U.S. military for quite some time. And he had ex the, the patriotic assassin, as Bowert calls him, uh, had extensive experience with mind control. And Nip Tuck and I are going to read you a couple of pages here, sort of as a a final comment on uh, mind control assassination for this program. <clears throat> what do you know, again, this is uh, Boer talking to the assassin, what do you know about the military or the intelligence agency's use of pain drug hypnosis, I asked. They used several different things. I've seen, actually seen, guys coming back with blanks only in certain places of their memory. Let's say that I know positively, not by hearsay, that it's done. You've seen it, I asked. You'll never get it me you'll never get me to admit it, he grinned. Well, how is it done? I asked. They use hypnosis and hypnotic drugs. They also use electronic manipulation of the brain. They use ultrasonics which will boil your brain. When they use hypnosis, they'll at the same time be using a set of earphones which repeat, You do not know this or that, over and over. They turn on the sonics at the same time, and the electrical patterns which give you memory are scrambled. Again, that recalls EDOM. You can't hear the ultrasonics and you can't feel it unless they leave it on. Then it boils your gray matter. Unless the assassin had done the same research I had, he could only have known this through first-hand experience. The CIA documents released in 1976 revealed that ultrasonic research was undertaken for a period of more than 20 years. But the document said that the research had stopped, so I asked him about that. Yeah, the research has stopped. They've gone operational. It ain't research anymore. They know how to do it, he said. Do you mean that it is your opinion that it hasn't stopped, or do you mean that you know it hasn't stopped? I mean, I know it hasn't stopped, he said. For example, suppose that a dictator in some South American country is setting up some real problems and we try to kick him out. We call in some of my former group and say, Look, the bastard has got to have a fatal accident and it's got to look good, like he fell on a bar of soap and broke his neck in the bathtub or something. So we go down there and get the job done. But it could be quite embarrassing if any of the guys were cross-examined about where they'd been and what they'd done. So the guys who were in on the job suddenly have a cold or something, and then they are put in a hospital for maybe just a routine checkup. They come out of the hospital in about 15 days. They're alive, they're well, they're healthy, and they're happy too. Lots of luck if you question them. They don't remember anything. That's one way it's used. The other way is to use it to improve memory, say with couriers. You want a secret message carried outside the chain of command, there's no need to have it carried by a person if it's a legal message, because the military has got a thousand ways of sending messages which are unbreakably secret. But if it's outside the chain of command, as so many things are these days, if it's an illegal message and our Constitution doesn't permit us to do much that is legal, then you have a hypno-programmed guy carry the message. You improve his memory so that he can carry on an enti carry an entire coded book of what appears to be gibberish, and when he's got it down, you give him amnesia and seal off that message by a post-hypnotic code word and whammo. You've got a real good secret courier, unless he, unless, because he can be tortured to death, but he can't remember unless the proper cue is uttered. Then, if the courier is going to operate against the enemy, who might have the techniques of hypnosis down, you give him several layers of post-hypnotic command. Recall the four zombie states of Castillo in connection with assassination, interrupting, of course. In the first layer, he'll confess a false message. In the second layer, he'll confess another different false message. Finally, maybe on the fourth or fifth layer is the real message. Our guy who was supposed to get the message knows that the first three cues say are fake, and he gives the fourth cue, and out comes the correct message. If the courier was in enemy hands, he could be there for years before anybody will figure out where he was in all those layers. Each identity will probably be that of a real cutout, a person enough like him so that the enemy will think they've got the real guy. And Nip Tuck will continue at this point. Many of the men in my unit were given assignments after which they were so 
persuaded that they didn't remember anything. I mean to say they'd gone, on, gone in believing that the only thing in life that meant anything to them was completing the assignment to get it done, and when they got done with it, they couldn't remember anything about it. Could these guys have been that way without hypnosis, I asked? Well, they could have believed that their mission in life was that particular assignment. They usually had no family affiliations, no friends, nothing but their careers. But I don't think they'd have forgotten about those kind of assignments, not without a little help, let us say. What was the conditioning that these guys had? Was it drugs, hypnosis, or something else? I wanted to know. Hypnosis, electrotherapy, programming them by tapes, by voice over earphones, awake or in trance or asleep, by a number of methods. How widespread was this mind control, I asked. Well, it was, well, that is something I can't really answer. I know of several different groups upon whom it was used. I know that it was used in some of the hairier areas of Korea and Vietnam, and it was started in World War II, but it has been refined far more since then. How much of it was used, I don't know. I know of several groups that I was affiliated with that, it had, that, it ha that had it used on them. Would you say this kind of thing did not exist before World War II? I asked. Oh, it did, but it was not in such a sophisticated form. It's as old as man, but now it's refined to an art. Before it was torture and psychological pressure. That can accomplish a lot. We've been trained to use it in primitive field situations. But now it's done with the idea that the mind can be put under complete control, just like they used to use rubber hoses at the police stations. They don't do that anymore. Well, rubber hoses still work, but they don't work as well as some of the other things which the police now have. Are you saying that the police also use mind control? I asked. At the highest levels, yes. The FBI certainly uses it, and they, of course, give it a lot of help, give a lot of help to the local police. There are certain areas of the brain which control your inhibitions. When they control those centers, then the subject will go on with his assignment, regardless. I've seen men whose mother could be sitting there having coffee, and if they'd been instructed to kill her, they'd walk right in and shoot her. And it wouldn't even upset their appetites for supper. They were conditioned to do it in such a way that they have no guilt. They wouldn't have guilt because after they were through, they wouldn't even remember it. Okay. Well, again, uh, notice the de degree of coincidence between the patriotic assassin and some of the information that we presented in connection not only with the uh, de the audiovisual desensitization of Mr. Narut's assassins, as well as Mr. Castillo. Note uh, the, of course, the patriotic assassin. Again, he was an actual U.S. government assassin. Uh, note the the his discussion concerning the couriers and how the extent to which uh, couriers are given several different false identities, uh, several different identities, most of which are, are uh, designed to give false information. Now, in connection with Castillo, we don't know how much of what he said was true and how much was false. But uh, it certainly is reminiscent of the Castillo situation. And uh, note also that the patriotic assassin claims that the police and FBI are using mind control. This is something that, uh, that we don't have a whole lot of information on from other contexts, but it's worth noting here. And also, as we said, the technology that we're using now, that we've been describing, the RHICEDOM, is quite primitive. Now, uh, ultrasonics were mentioned by the, uh, the uh, patriotic assassin as one way of... Uh, dissolving memory and doing certain things. That, of course, is consistent with the EDOM and the device that uh, the little generator transmitter that we heard that was talked about, although that may have been, that was electrical, this is ultrasonic. And uh, perhaps most importantly of all, keep in mind the uh, statement by the patriotic assassin that the research has stopped, because they always say with the officials when questioned about mind control, they say, oh yeah, we were doing research on it, but it was unsuccessful and it stopped. Well, obviously it was not unsuccessful. And the research may have stopped, but that's only because it was so successful that it's now operational. All right. We're going to take a short break, and then we are going to be opening up the telephones.